stands in holy perfection sinless so pure no stain the very thought of sin loses his anger his thunderous wrath set against hell's domain my life began in condemnation sinful and destined to die on my own i found no consolation until the day a spotless lamb heard my cry my blessed savior is standing in the presence of god declaring that i've been made clean this holy god who looks within cannot see my sin there is a precious lamb who stands in between now there is no condemnation i know such freedom from sin there's not a doubt that all cross heaven's portal as god declares that i'm sinless within my blessed savior is standing in the presence of god declaring that i've been made clean this holy precious lamb that stands in between oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow precious lamb that stands in between amen thank you for that aren't you glad for the precious flow of the blood of the lamb praise the lord for that second timothy chapter three like you take the word of god with me go to second timothy chapter three begin reading verse one in just a minute After decades of service to our nation, both in war and in peace, as many knew him as General George Washington, but then President George Washington completed his second term. And in his farewell address to the nation, he wrote this, and I quote, Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. These firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. Speaking of religion and morality is the words he used. You know, America was never a Christian nation in the sense that everyone was a believer. But there's no question our government was set up on Christian principles. And our pe the people believed and in fact came to this land for religious freedom. 
And we have always stood, we've always stood as Christian people, we've always stood for people to have freedom and have freedom to act according to their conscience. We believe in the priesthood of every believer. We believe in uh, the idea of individual soul liberty. That God has not made two groups, the clergy and the laity, as God condemns the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in the Revelation there. That God has made the opportunity for every person to enter in, like we just did a minute ago, beyond the veil by the blood of Jesus into the throne room of God. And you have access just as much as I have access, access or any other Christian leader has access to the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing that is. And that's what we believe. And as we see though, those things changing in our nation, in our government, our government begins to punish good. They begin to promote evil, it seems. It is more important than ever that we do what we can to influence and shape our society. I think we ought to encourage the leaders that are wanting to do right. And we certainly have the right and duty to be involved as citizens in the government and voting and that type of thing. But the ultimate solution, ultimate solution to the problem is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we believe, and that certainly is the answer. There's no doubt about that. We must get the gospel to people. The answer is not found in the political arena or in the social arena or any other arena. It's found only in the spiritual arena. That's the place it's found. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we begin reading in verse 1, the Bible says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. We believe we're living in those last days. In fact, I believe we're living in the last of the last days. Verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. The word incontinent means literally coming apart. Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But the Ben shared with me this morning, now it's the second person here recently that has said to them, I don't believe in the Bible, and I guess I'll just rather go to hell then, and burn in hell. That's a reprobate thinking. Verse 9, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, Manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, in all. You find yourself in verse 12? Yea, in all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What shall we do? But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, unto all good works. Once you take note what the Bible says in verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, Paul speaks in verse 11 of these persecutions and afflictions that he endured as a Christian, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I want to bring you these last five things. I shared with you three responses this morning, tonight, the five more responses. Actions that we as Christians in America must take 
to honor the Lord and make a difference in our culture. And I continue this title of how should Christian Americans respond. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us this evening. Lord, we need you now. I pray you'd help us as we look into your word to know what you'd have us to do in this hour. May we follow what your word teaches. And Lord, may we not be ashamed of your gospel or of you, Lord, our Savior. Thank you for these here tonight. May you speak to each and every one of us here in this room. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I shared with you the first three responses were never be ashamed of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, hold to the truth. Number three, assemble with believers of the truth. You notice the recurring theme, the truth. Interesting in 2 Timothy 3 as he talks about these perilous times, he says in verse 7, never learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. In verse 8, these do also resist the truth. The truth. Well, I'll give you number four, love and forgive those who oppose the truth of God's Word. How should we respond? We need to love and forgive those who oppose the truth of God's Word. Those who have made their rally cry tolerance to get to the position of the majority that they now have are really not tolerant at all. Their goal is dominance. When they get in the majority, they become a dominant where you are not allowed to disagree with what they teach. If you hold to the scripture belief of marriage, you're the enemy. If you hold to the fact that Jesus is the only way to heaven, you are a bigot, you're a hater, that type of thing. And by the way, they won't be having anti-bullying days in the public schools in support of Christian children who are discriminated against. Because this tolerant crowd will be the bullies. You watch. Hey, this is what Paul Chapel wrote, the pastor of Lancaster Baptist Church. He's the president of West Coast Baptist College out there in California. He wrote, in the months preceding the decision of Overfull versus Hodges, as the decision was beginning, weigh, being weighed, excuse me, and the oral arguments presented to the Supreme Court, I don't know of a period when I've had more profanity coming through my various inboxes. Call after call, email after email, public and private message through social media streams, Things said by the tolerance crowd were unrepeatable. End of quote. And of course, the temptation for us as Christians is to fight fire with fire, to fight back and respond to that. But that's not what you find the Lord Jesus has for us. As I shared this morning, they are not our enemies, they're our mission field. Paul said, if such were some of you, you were involved in these things, but the glorious gospel, the dynamite power of the gospel is more powerful than any sin and can wash anyone white as snow. That's what we believe. And so we have to remember, you're never going to belittle, you're never going to argue, you're never going to uh, condemn someone into heaven. It doesn't work that way. They're the mission field. We need to get the gospel to them. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us who our enemy is. We have to remember the enemy. The enemy is not people. We don't fight a physical battle. It's a spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put ye on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That means, wives, your husband's not your enemy, you know. <laughs> husband's your wife's not your enemy. Pa uh, children, teenagers, your, your parents are not your enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, he says. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, some have tried to make these different levels in the demonic realm. But regardless, he's talking about a spiritual warfare, not a physical one. So we must remember what our weapons are. Our weapons are prayer, as we just did together. Our weapons are the Word of God. Our weapons is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the love of God. The power that is there is unbelievable. They expect us to ridicule and, and criticize what, what they stand for, but if we present them with the love of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's a totally different thing. That's the way Jesus was. When other people walk by the story of the Good Samaritan, here comes the priest, here comes the Levite, surely they would help this man. But they would not because they looked at him with disdain. He was a Samaritan. He was a half-breed. Not interested. 
Not Jesus, the picture of the Good Samaritan. He was his friend. He loved him. Just like the woman at the well and on and on you could go. So we must love and forgive those that oppose the truth of God's word. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The mistake that Jeroboam made that we've talked about in underestimating the great value of the blessing of God on his life. God said, I'll make you like David. I'll bless you like I blessed David. Yet he underestimated the value of God's blessing. He was paranoid and concerned that he would lose control of the people if they went down to Jerusalem, into Judah, into, into the two tribes that he did not have. And so he made these false idols. And in America, we've done the same thing. We have underestimated the value of the blessing hand of God. We think we've made this country great, but it was never the people. It was always the God of the people that made it great. And so we have to understand our weapons, the value and the power of prayer. We underestimate it. The value and the power, the Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That word power there is dunamos. It speaks of the dynamite power of the gospel. How someone that you might think well, it looks like some biker guy, someone with tattoos and, and big muscle, and, and, and he's, he's a guy with leather on and all this, some scary man that would be a criminal of some sort, you might think, or we might stereotype in that way. God says the power of the gospel can break the heart of stone. The power of the gospel, it's a hammer that breaks up the heart. It's the sword that pierces to the heart of a person. And so we underestimate these things. These are our weapons. Prayer, the, the Word of God, the gospel, and then the love of God. We get kind of callous sometimes. We sing the song, I love to tell the story, but I think sometimes we get a little callous to the story. The love that God showed through Jesus Christ sending His Son. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. But if you read that verse, you must think, if you go to Romans and compare Romans 5, God had the greatest love because he didn't lay down his life just for his friends. He laid down his life for his enemies. We were at enmity with God, the Bible says. We were against God. We were enemies of God. He that's friend of the world, the Bible says, the enemy of God. And yet he died for us. What a love. And see, I believe that in years to come, there are going to be many people disillusioned by what they thought the LGBT, the same-sex marriage, transgender lifestyle would bring them. They thought it would fill something that they've been missing, and yet they'll find it will not fill the void. And I want to be there with the love of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ to show them there's something that will fill that void. Amen. See, sin always hurts. And there'll be people that come out of that type of lifestyle that are so hurt, so broken, near suicide perhaps, who knows, where there'll be painful, immoral relationships that'll be hurtful. And by the way, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You can call it whatever you want, but you cannot get away from the consequences of sin. I want to be there with the gospel, don't you? To share the love of God with these people. This is what God wants us to do. That's what every sinner needs. You're a sinner and I'm a sinner. This whole world, we're sinners, aren't we? May God help us. Consider the woman at the well. Here she was, still thirsty. Uh, the disciples... Wondered why Jesus was talking to her. They wouldn't have talked to her. They had no interest in speaking to her. And they wondered why he spoke to this woman at the well. Here she was seeking a, yet another relationship to maybe fill the void. She had five husbands. Now she's living with a man that wasn't her husband. Nothing would satisfy. She was still thirsty. And Jesus finally was able to satisfy. He loved her. He treated her with kindness and respect. And he won her to himself. And she became a dynamic witness that reached a city Someone that they wouldn't even have looked at. They wouldn't have spoken to because of prejudice. I want to preach Jesus in such a way that the love of God shines through. That the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, He was full of grace and truth. We, we like to emphasize the truth, and I'm for the truth, but He was full of grace. He loved people where they were. He, he took time to talk to the beggar and the blind man. 
people that were outcast, the publicans, the sinners, the, 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 the harlots, the Bible says, He spent time. He shared the gospel with them. What a love. May the Lord help us to have the love that Jesus showed to us and to other sinners to show to them. He loves you. He'll forgive you. He'll save you. That needs to be our message. Fifth response that we need to have is we need to teach our children the truth. We must teach our children, our grandchildren, the truth. The only thing I can pass on to my children is truth. Deuteronomy 6, 4-9 through 9 tells us that night, day, home and away, we are to share this truth of God's Word with our children all the time. Deuteronomy 6, the Bible says in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. You have to get that part first. Grandparent, you want to invest in your grandchild? You want to see God do something then? Then you have to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind first. Parent, you want to have an impact on your child? Then we must love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul first. And then he says in verse 6, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. This is not just to be something we believe, but it becomes a part of us. And then thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. To talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. And they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. The hardest hit targets of the campaign for same-sex marriage are young people. This is a carefully crafted and planned agenda, especially in the universities, but even in the public schools, no doubt about it. It's been underway for decades. This mindset of saying this is normal, this is okay, this is right, this is good. To indoctrinate, to recruit to that lifestyle, to convince them that this is normal and God's ways are too harsh and too judgmental and inapplicable to the age in which we live. Now listen to this. This is similar to the mentality of the LGBT agenda. Adolf Hitler, in a speech shortly before he assumed full power over Germany, said this, When an opponent declares, I will not come over to your side, I calmly say, your child belongs to us already. What are you? You'll pass on. Your descendants, however, now stand in the new camp. And in a short time, they will know nothing else but this new community. That's what our children, grandchildren are going to grow up in. This is normal, the new normal. That's the indoctrination that has be, already begun for years now and will continue even more aggressively now that it's recognized officially as our country stands. There's a similar mentality of the activists for that group. They work to gain acceptance and approval for their cause in the hearts and minds of young people, our children. Folks, it's always been critical for Christian parents to teach their children the truth, but never more vital than the day and age which we live in. To teach them the Word of God, to instill the Word of God in the hearts of children. Deuteronomy 6 is God's plan. This is God's plan for shaping the future, for shaping a child's mind and shaping future generations to live for God. And he said there, Deuteronomy 6, if you continue the passage, he says, when your child shall ask you about the monument there, about the statute that we believe, you shall tell them what God did in Egypt in delivering God's people, bringing them into this land that flowed with milk and honey. Tell them of what God did. And we need Christians today that will tell their children what God has done for them, what God will do. And God would warn them, be careful. When you come to these cities you didn't build, we come and eat of these vineyards you didn't plant. When you live in these houses that you didn't build, he says, be careful that you forget not God. And of course we know in just a few generations in Judges, the Bible says there arose a generation that knew not the Lord. The parents didn't tell them. And if we look in America, if the statistic I gave this morning is true, that the largest and fastest growing, not the largest, but the fastest growing demographic in America, religious demographic is unchurched. That's the fastest growing. And that means parents have not taught the children. Because if we have, we'd be growing, not the other way around. 
So God help us. We must teach our children. Beyond this, we as Christian parents and Christians' homes need to model what God said Christian parents and Christian homes ought to look like. We ought to show them. Show your daughters what to look for in a godly husband, man. Now show your sons, ladies, what a, they, to look for in a Christian wife. Now show your kids what a home one day ought to look like with a Christian mom and a Christian dad serving together, loving the Lord together, having a home as a piece of heaven on earth. They're not going to see it in Hollywood what the home ought to look like. We are to be that training ground of what their home will look like. As someone said, we would have done a better job, all of us raising our children, if it had dawned on us soon enough that they would raise our grandchildren. <laughs> but may the Lord help us. For many years, our culture has been pushing and promoting this LGBT agenda through movies and music and media and even the so-called anti-bullying program is often just a promotion of the gay agenda. For the record, I'm against bullying any child for any reason. But you look into it a little bit deeper, the anti-bullying program. My wife has looked into it and saw the same. You start looking, it's more to anti-bullying program than just anti-bullying. It's propaganda. They're filling our minds of our children. Very interesting. There's Christian writers writing about this same thing. 2 Timothy 3.15, notice what it says here in our text, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That from a child, that from a child. Above everything else, parents, we are to saturate the mind of our children with the Word of God. That's what God's given us to do. From a child, how can they recognize the lies in our culture? That from a child. They've known the Holy Scriptures. They've been taught the truth. They can recognize the air because they know the truth. Not just the truth of this Word, but the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. May God help us. May we seize the golden moments of life, as the Bible says, when they lie down, when they rise up, when they walk by the way, when you sit in your house. May we seize it. May we not miss what God would have us do. And grandparents, don't underestimate your influence, the power of influence for us parents and grandparents on these children. Will we seize it? Will we take the opportunity to influence their mind? The devil's after it. They're after the mind. The battle is for the mind. It's a, not a physical body of a battle, but a spiritual battle. And we see the Bible example. Several of this in, in the scriptures throughout Timothy right here is an example. Here's a young man that didn't have a Christian dad. His dad was a Greek, wasn't a believer. But his grandmother and his mother, Eunice and Lois, taught him the Word of God. And that from a child. That was known in the Holy Scriptures. In, in, earlier in the, in the book, he would talk about it, the faith, the unfeigned faith that was first in your grandmother and then your mother, and now I believe is in you also. The impact that they had. And Timothy, of course, was a faithful Christian, followed Paul as his mentor there, and he took the place of Paul, so to speak, as Paul passed on in this second Timothy, his last writing. Moses grew up in a wicked culture. Think of Egypt, the false gods, the immorality, the things he grew up in, but what happened? He had a mother. <laughs> you know the story, he's putting the little ark, and Sister Miriam watches to see what would become of him, and Pharaoh's daughter picks him up and takes him as her own, and Miriam says, would you like a nurse to, to, to wean until the child's weaned to feed him? So she goes and gets her his own mother, Jochebed. And she, while she nurses the child, instills the Word of God in him. That's an amazing thing. She only had him until he was weaned. And I know it was a little older then, but still, the impact that was made. She understood her time was limited. The opportunity was fleeting. And he would go now to Pharaoh's and he was trained to be the next Pharaoh. And all their wicked philosophy of Pharaoh and the false gods of Egypt. And what happened? Hebrews 11. The Bible says in verse 24 and 25, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Where in the world did Moses learn that? He learned it from his mother. 
the opportunity, the impact made at a young age. The devil knows that. And he's trying to get them while they're young as, as well. How about the little maid? Here she is, a captive in Syria. Naaman's wife has this little maid. Naaman, Naaman the great general of Syria, has leprosy. And this little maid, she's a captive, but someone instilled the Word of God in her and the power of God working through God's people, what God can do. And she said, would to God that Naaman was in Israel where there's a prophet, Elisha, could heal him of leprosy. A little maid that believed God. The amazing thing is, if you study that, Elisha, the Bible says in the New Testament there in Luke 4, Jesus said, Elisha didn't heal any other leper. There was many lepers in the day of Naaman, but none of them were healed. She believed God could do it, though it never had happened before. Someone had instilled in her a faith in the power of God through God's people what God could do. She believed He could do the impossible. We must teach our children. Sixth, our response, we must encourage political leaders that hold the truth. We must encourage political leaders that hold the truth. This must be our response as Christians in America. Pray for them. Write them. Thank them for standing for God, those that do. Exercise our right to call them and say, we're for this, we're against this. Vote for these that stand for the truth. David Gibbs uh, stood out in my mind back uh, two or three years ago, they had, um, oh, I can't think of the meeting now, uh, some type of conference there, and David Gibbs came down, they had it over in Somerville. But David Gibbs, Christian Law Association, he's up in Washington all the time uh, in, in the Christian Law Association and doing different things like that. And he said in that breakfast, it just stood out to me, he said, the people in Washington, the government, the Congress, the senators, he says, they hate you, talking to these preachers. They hate you. He said, if you heard the way they spoke about people that believe the Bible, the foul language they use, they hate Christians. That's what he said. I was shocked by that. Paul used his Roman citizenship. He used it. He used the opportunity there. He never had the privilege to vote for government officials that we had, but remember the one time they beat him, and they said, they found out later they were Romans, and he, they said, go, let them go, so they don't, no one finds out because they beat him as a Roman. He said, no, you have them come down here and get me out. And he wanted his record ex expunged there. And not only that, Paul would avoid a beating one time by saying, you're going to beat and bind a Roman citizen without cause? And it stopped. He used his citizenship, and I think we ought to use it. In the coming days, discrimination towards Christians is in, the, in the public realm is going to become more common. We're going to be treated like second-class citizens in some ways, simply because we're Christian. Remember, though, we often see the greatest spiritual progress in the darkest times. When it gets dark, all of a sudden God's people begin to realize we need God. They begin praying, they begin seeking His face, and God begins to work. It was never the people or the government, it was never the land that made this country great, remember, it was the God of the people, the God of the government, the God of this land that made us great. We can seek Him again. Encourage the efforts by our elected officials to protect churches, to protect Christian schools, to protect Christian businessmen, to, to protect Christians. Encourage that. And I reiter reiterate that America's problem is not primarily political. It's not social. It's a spiritual problem. So the real and lasting solution is the gospel. Number seven, the response of Christians pray for revival in our nation that we might turn back to the truth. Pray for revival in our nation, that we might turn back to the truth. There's never been a revival in human history that was not preceded by, by a turning away from God. Else there would not have been a need for revival. Before the Great Awakening was the Dark Ages. Uh, there has always been a dark time spiritually before a revival. So pray that God would revive us. There is hope. For any nation, not in political change or social change, but in the spiritual of turning back to God. We must get busy about reaching people. We must get busy about the gospel. We must pray for revival. We must go after people for the gospel's sake. We don't look to the government or society at large for change. We must ask God to revive His church. Remember, revival does not start out there. It doesn't start out there. It starts with God's people. When God's people 
begin to understand how they need the Lord and repent, the Bible says, then He'll heal our land. But what happens is when God's people get right, they get on their heart what God has on His heart. They begin getting the gospel to people. They begin to make God's business our business, that we must seek and save that which is lost, like Jesus' goal and His mission was. If churches across America were shaken with a fervor and intense desire to see God work, our culture, our America, would soon be impacted by the church again. Dr. R.B. Olette, the pastor, where my parents were the staff evangelists out of, and now they've went back into Canada, but, but they were for the last several years, he said this, to say that America is beyond hope is to deny the possibility of revival and to doubt the power of God. How we need to pray for revival. Remember the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And eighthly, the last thing, the last response for Christians in America, we need to live in the hope of the truth of Christ's return. Live in the hope of the truth of Christ's return. The foundation of society may shift, may crumble underneath us, it may seem, but the foundations of faith in God remain secure. He is coming back. I read Revelation this week, and the Bible says over and over, Behold, I come quickly. These things must shortly be done. He's coming back. What an encouragement. What a comfort. I love these words in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord Himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And what a day, glorious day that will be, to be with Him. But this truth doesn't just bring comfort and peace. It should change the way we live. That's what the Bible said. Titus talked about that, saying that we look for this glorious hope, this hope, and because of that, the grace of God teaches us to be holy, to live righteous lives, to live in godliness. Uh, turn with me to 1 John 3, would you? And leave your place in Timothy. Go to 1 John 3. We'll end here. 1 John chapter 3. Look at verse 1. 1 John 3 verse 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Amen. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when, we sh when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. And we all say hallelujah. Verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. It changes the way we live, knowing that he's coming for us. 2 Peter chapter 3, he would write about this. Verse 3 and on, he says, knowing this first, that in the last days there's a coffer is going to come, walking after their own lusts, saying, where's the promise of His coming? Where is Jesus? He says, coming back. You know this, the passage there. You come down to verse 9, the Bible says, the Lord's not slack concerning His promise. Some men count slackness, but His long-suffering to us were, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. As the thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And then he says this, verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Because he's coming, before, because we understand this world is going to be dissolved, your house you can't take with you, your cars you won't take with you, your bank accounts you won't take with you, your retirement, the vacation, that's all going to be gone. He says, because we know that, what type of person should we be? What type of person should we, how should we live in godliness and purity? The world loves to mock moral failures of Christians, don't they? And they like to point at the failures in marriage in people that are called Christians and say, see, you don't value marriage that much. Unfortunately, sometimes we give them a point. But keeping our focus on the return of Jesus not only brings comfort to our lives, but it'll help us to live holy lives, pure lives, not giving the unbelievers a reason to reject the gospel. Well, in conclusion tonight, as we think about the conclusion of this message, 
This series really I urge you to be loyal to Christ. In these last days, be loyal to the truth. He is the truth. When we take a stand for the faith, we are following in a long line of Christians that have stood for the truth, stood for God. Even if it means we have to oppose culture like Paul and Peter and John did, there were godly men and women that stood for the truth, even if it cost them their lives. People like Hugh Latimer and Nicholas, Rid Nicholas Ridley that I mentioned this morning. People like John Huss. God used John Wycliffe, his writings, to influence John Huss. John Huss was in Bohemia, what we would call modern-day Czech Republic. But he was raised in the Church of Rome. Not only was he raised in it, he became a priest, John Huss. A Roman Catholic priest. But through studying the Scripture and Wycliffe's writings both... He came to know Jesus as his Savior and said that salvation is through grace alone. As you could imagine, as he began to preach the gospel boldly, the people in the church hated it. The common people heard him gladly, but the archbishop of Prague and different ones condemned him. In his book on the church, he defended the authority of the clergy, but claimed that God alone, God alone can forgive sin, he said. He also claimed that no pope or bishop could establish doc doctrine that was contrary to the Bible. These are things we'd believe. He also wrote no, uh, that, that uh, no, Christian, no true Christian could obey a clergyman's order if it was plainly wrong according to the Bible. So he was excommunicated from the church. He was called to the Council of Constance. A dirty trick was played on. They promised, even the pope promised. He said, if my own brother's life depended on it, I will not... I promise you, safe passage, I will not, we will not imprison you. So he comes to the Council of Constance. Of course, they lied. Put him in prison before they ever got to the council. They say they put, he put him, in a, they put him in a prison right near where the sewage dumped out. Wasn't well, a prison like we have today. But at his trial, Huss testified that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. By grace alone. And he was sentenced to die at the stake. When Huss was being chained to the stake with a rusty chain to be burned alive, he said, My Lord Jesus Christ was bound with a harder chain than this for my sake. Why then should I be ashamed of this rusty one? Just before the fire was lit, the marshal there urged him to recant, and he said, Know what I taught with my lips, I seal with my blood. Surrounded by flames, Huss sang, the old hymn in Latin, Christ, thou son of the living God, have mercy upon me until he entered the presence of the Lord. When I think of men and women of the past that have stood for Christ like this, in the midst of tremendous op opposition, tremendous persecution, I have two thoughts. First of all, I don't want to be the weak link in the line of believers that have stood for the truth. I don't want to be the weak link in the chain in my generation of people standing for the truth. But also it shows me that the grace of God is greater than any suffering. The grace of God is sufficient for any suffering that may come. We can stand for Him. What kept these men going in the face of persecution and death? How did they stand strong and courageous? They understood that ultimately they were standing and following Christ who gives the victory. What an opportunity. It's our turn, friends. This is our turn. This is our opportunity. We're only passed this way once. And may we as God's people take our turn. Take our stand for the Lord Jesus Christ in our generation. The Bible says about David, he fell on sleep after he had given himself for his generation. He impacted his generation. What about us? Will we declare the gospel? Will we love the lost? Will we live in light of eternity? How will we respond to what's going on in our nation? How will you respond? What will we do as Christians? I challenge you, know what you believe. Study the Word of God. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Know what you believe and be able to show someone from the Bible what you believe. Know who you follow. Be assured, Christ is still building His church. And He wants to use you and me to do it. Let's bow in prayer.